religion without a culture. And that's a problem too, because religion and culture go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to go to it because um, we, we can get to either one of them. So, um, just just quickly, uh, with regards to divinity, for me, um, I, I don't actually look at an individual god or or a person that stands in front of me. Um, I was raised in a pagan tradition. It was a matriarchal um, society, basically. My mother and ten children, and um, uh, you know, we were brought up to to. Um, understand that that goddess is the creative source, and um, the creative source being female. And if you take a look around in nature, uh, there's no king, no prophet, no no tycoon who has ever ever come to this planet any other way than through the body of a woman, and the woman uh, is is the vessel of birth. And so I have always viewed the world as goddess, the earth as as the divine as feminine, um, and and other energies within that as masculine. So there's a duality. There's a duality, and and it's a projection. It is it is um, it is not necessarily. I, I don't um, don't have this particular idea of of goddess as a person. It's it is concepts and ideas that are personified, and um, uh, so so I don't consider myself. Godless, because I do um, connect with with energies that are outside um, and larger than myself. However, I also believe that I'm a co-creator, a partner um, in in that that uh, um, life that is being lived. Well, we worked with the information desk yesterday. We were saying, "Why are you here?" To answer questions, what kind of questions? Well, what is God? <laughs> he said, "You have an answer." I said, "If I had an answer, we wouldn't be here, right?" <laughs> so, um, it's a mystery. It really remains. I think one of the things that I most love about this work that has held me to it for my entire adult life um, is the constant engagement, and that every t every time I think I uh, I have reached uh, some understanding, the, the game begins again. The next, the next path of the labyrinth is put in front of me. The, the next labyrinth appears, and I'm re-engaged. And so it's, 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 it's a constant uh, dance together. And, and I, uh, to me, the whole thing is from before the moment you're born until long after you're gone, it is sacred. And every aspect of where we are, every bit of it, this realm of being is an expression of, it's a, the natural order is a holy order. It reflects the divine, it is, it is the divine's creation. The divine does not make it and go, you know, out for a beer and leave behind. <laughs> it's ever, it is within its creation. And uh, so the possibility of being in the presence of the sacred is constant. And, and how it expresses itself, whether through tree or season or, or profit or or um, or astonishing manifestation of, of, of being, which I have had because recently it was totally transformed my life. Once again, here we go again. Um, I mean, it's one thing to go to an altered state and sort of see the sacred, but when the sacred sort of tries to take on form so you can see it in this realm, you become re-engaged in your reality and your, your, pre, your own preconceived notions. And that's happened recently. It's feminine, it's masculine, it's beyond gender. I can access it through a particular cultural deity on occasion. I am in a state of blit through my practice being in, being a, being in nature. Uh, it has no uh, gender. It's yeah, feminine, it's, it's masculine, it's, it's, it's the air. air. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's everything. everything. It's, it's, sometimes vocabulary can be so limiting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mystery. 
it's a mystery. And, and we can attach certain words to it to help us understand, but those are just symbols. I think people always say, what is, you know, you use the word magic, and to yeah. me, magic, <laughs> to me, uh, it, magic is, is, it is that co-creation. We're living, we are living in, within a universe that is alive and that uh, interacts with us. Um, and because we have these marvelous practices, we're able to constantly engage and, and be engaged. So we, and those practices keep us from becoming dogmatic and certain about, you know, it is this, you know, and it wears a particular hat, and it, you know, and you do this to make it happy. It, you know, it made that maybe for five minutes, and then it transforms, and it will be different for you than it was for me, because it's, it's, all, it's all. Well, I think in modern paganism, there's a lot of emphasis on personified anthropomorphic deities, and we certainly have a good example of that because <coughs> That's in the mainstream culture, that's really where we have Christianity has personified the divinity as the proverbial bearded old man in the sky. Um, I think, uh, well, you know, some 30 years ago, a brilliant uh, feminist theologian by the name of Mary Bailey wrote a book entitled uh, Beyond God the Father. And she made a very provocative statement that probably had not been made before. And she said, oh, When God is male, the male yeah. is God. And, and that really was the launching point, in, in a way, for the entire feminist spirituality movement. I think that there's a further statement that needs to be addressed, which is that when God is human, the human is God. Absolutely. And I think in one of the worst problems that we have in the world today, perhaps the most important and the worst problem in the world today, is really racism. But it's not, it's not a problem of the the white race versus the black race versus the red race versus the yellow race, whatever, is it probably the human race versus the races of other beings in the planet? That we have become, we have, we have attempted to separate ourselves from the rest of the natural world and act as though we were superior, we were more important, we were entitled to do whatever. And in the mainstream religion of the mainstream culture, we are given permission to do that. We have been entrusted with the natural world. It, but nature, nature includes us, but transcends us. And nature isn't human, and it's not about humans. You know, we, if we live long enough, or maybe you know, we won't. But, but our future descendants, whatever they may be, maybe you know, cyborg beings or whatever they want to be, you know, they will maybe see human beings as this, this totally transitory stage in the process of evolution that really wasn't very meaningful after all. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. who, who knows? Who knows? You know, I, I have a friend who says that that the basic function of human beings is simply to be mitochondrial carriers, uh, and that, that's that, that's it for all our self-importance or whatever. But but uh, in a lot of indigenous traditions, there is that sense that the sacred is not human, includes human, but is not human. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the uh, let me just, uh, in the tradition that I inherited, the pagan tradition that, 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 um, that was passed on to me, came from the Gaelic-speaking areas of the Scottish Highlands. It was a Celtic tradition that was maintained as many such traditions have been maintained throughout Europe by, by small communities or families, usually in secret because they, you know, they would be ostracized by their communities if they were found out. And they did not worship deities in the way that most pagans think of them. They have this concept of what they call anam. And anam is the soul, the spirit. Anam is, is uh, the, the individual spirit of each being, but it's also the force that, that uh, enlivens the entire world of creation. Uh, the trees, the rocks, the, the water, everything is a manifestation of anam. And beyond anam is what they call the jivran mur. And the Jivram word simply is a Gallic word that terms a Gallic term that means the great mystery, the great unknown. So I tell people that in my religion we have the most definite <coughs> answer to the great question of what the universe is about. I can tell you to you in just a few words. It's a mystery. <laughs> you know, it's are. a mystery religion, 
And, you know, <laughs> it's a mystery. We don't have to explain anything because for all the explanations that we try to have, they don't matter. You know, I mean, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, you know, whatever, all the different religions that, that have explanations, uh, you know, they have their explanations and they can accept them and so on. There's no way of knowing that any of that is true. It's still a mystery at, at the core of it. And so we don't need to do that. The the Latina. Okay, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> We're talking We're about that. Victor. Okay. So, um, we've got less than twenty minutes to, to take questions. Okay. Short answers. <laughs> okay. Yes. I've got a question that's forming in my mind throughout your your conversation with us, and uh, the question is, if we if it's true that we all came out of Africa then they all somewhat distantly related. We move to different, different lands and we move now more frequently, more often and further than ever before. People just get around. They don't stay in Europe or in Australia or in the US. They move about. And they always have. And uh, in a way, we have some kind of a particular experience in, in a different natural environment. Let's say, if I, as a person born in Germany, come to Australia, I can no longer sort of use the robin or the hawthorn bush or the oak as a teacher. I have to uh, deal with managums and, uh, and wattles, okay? <coughs> it's different. How, what's the logic then of me trying to hold on to, to that tradition? How can it be caught? Well, I think that's the problem with a, a lot of uh, place-based religion, and the reason why other forms of religion have, have, have taken a lot of sure. space from them is because they are more portable. Yes. Well, so you want to take that? Judaism is a perfect example of that. When you are cut off from the land, the law at the book becomes critical. That you can carry anywhere. Um, and it's a dilemma, and we struggle with it. And we struggle with it in the context of what do you do we understand and we work with the spirits of place, the spirits of the land. That is a primary aspect of our work. And the dilemma becomes when you are on the land of another indigenous people, how, you know, how do you work without appropriating? There are things called core shamanic techniques. They're shared by all indigenous cultures. We use those and they facilitate a connection uh, with the spirit of the land where you are that uh, may identify itself by the age-old name and image of the people who were there before you, but then you come in the appropriate and respectful manner. We were told recently, <coughs> work with the spirits of place, work with the spirits of the land. And in doing so, we're finding spirits, manifestations that are cross-cultural. I'm in Italy, and we're picking up the Hitter, which is a green man that preceded the Islamic tradition. We, we're working in, in Holland and we're getting information that has to do with Mayan and, and Toltec districts. So the land ultimately is the entire globe. My Next name question. is Trisha, and I'm from Gaia's Garden here in Melbourne, uh, which is a sacred space for women. Um, thank you. Um, in, in response to the question that was just asked, <coughs> it is a real challenge in the southern hemisphere <coughs> because and particularly in Australia, because we have a variation from seven to three seasons across the country, not eight. Um, so <coughs> in terms of Sabbaths, it, it is a challenge. And when we talk, even if we reverse summer and say um, summer solstice is in, the, is in December, uh, which it is, uh, we don't talk about the gentle green summer. We talk about the bloody red hot, boiling And so, getting and and the season, the uh, the directions are very different. The water for us is on the east if we're on the east coast. Um, the north is the fire because that's where the fire comes from. Sure, and the well, centre of the like country is the root. So, if I can just say that it is about being in touch with the spirit of our land yes. and where we fit and understanding the dreaming of the indigenous people. I just want to do a plug. Patricia Rose and I are doing a survey of the emergence of the goddess in Australia and what it means to be connected to the Australian landscape. And so I have 
a flyer to give people and they just need to press the button and it's online and we would love to hear from all of you, men and women. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to limit this to questions and we're going to be asking you to just ask the question and let us answer it so that we can use our time the best <coughs> possible way. Yes. Um, I'm also a reconstructionist but in the Jewish tradition and I find it more complicated to explain to people both within my Jewish narrative the issue of sacrifice and it's something that we have in common and it's deeply, deeply important. So I'd love to hear you on that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we have what some people call the pagan party line, which is what we normally say to the media and we normally say in public. And one of the things that the pagan party line says is that they have to perform sacrifice. Partially because we have to say that, because it's the thing that people immediately think of. For a lot of people, they think of pagan. And our faith. Right, right. The reality is that some of us actually do perform sacrifice. I live on a farm, like I was saying. We raise animals and we kill animals. When we raise animals and we kill animals, we do it in a sacred manner. We take those lives with an awareness that as we take their lives, our lives will be taken from us too. We have to do it with a ritual awareness that as we take their lives, so our life may be maintained, that we honor the lives of these chickens or of these turkeys, you know. But we take responsibility for the taking of the life that we consume. Most people in our culture are carnivorous, and the sacrifices were made long before the food got to them. Uh, I think it's also important to talk about the word sacrifice, because sacrifice is about doing something in a sacred manner. Randomly butchering and killing an animal or shooting wolves with high-powered guns from with helicopters from up the sky or whatever, that is not sacrifice. That is that is senseless killing and cruel cruelty of animals. You know, so sacrifice such as happens in the Jewish tradition and other many other religious traditions where animals are killed in a ritual sacred manner. That is sacrifice and it's not the random killing and torture. Of I personally am not somebody who practices any form of sacrifice. I'm not going to, to kill an animal for any of Never eat again. <laughs> but I, I'm not going. To, I'm not going to kill anything, except that I need to eat it, and that I, it, it, my survival depends upon it. That's how I rationalize the fact that I'm eating meat. But the the killing of an animal for a purpose that is not one's own survival, where you are killing a chicken because somebody's being initiated, or you're killing a goat because somebody's get you know has a curse on them, these are characteristic of not. Your not so much the Euro-Pagan traditions, we find them in uh, indigenous, and they tend to be cultures of poverty and, and disempowerment. Uh, they tend to be cultures where people are, are suffering tremendously. Where that sacrifice makes a huge difference to that person. Yeah, yeah, and they do tend to eat the animals that are sacrificed, so. Um, and I think it's just really important to point out that, you know, um, meat, chicken, and, and beef, and lamb, it doesn't grow in a field somewhere on a styrofoam tray like you find it in a grocery store. <laughs> Somebody killed that animal. And so, um, you know, when, when, for example, I, I'm very connected with a very small uh, family farm, and um, I saw the steer that is currently in my freezer get born, um, I, I interacted with it through its life, and I went in the truck with it when it was taken to the slaughterhouse. And for me, that was a very sacred thing to do because that that bull um, was known to me, and it became uh, a part of me that I was able to give thanks for the fact that it had fulfilled its life contract and was now going to sustain my family and friends, you know, on the barbecue. <laughs> in the backyard. And I think that it's really important to understand that, um, you know, if you're going to eat something, then there has to be some sort of an awareness as to, again, what happens before that? What happens before that? Where did it all start from? It's really easy to just wash your hands of the blood as you pull those packages out of the freezer at the store. I think that a lot of modern pagans are, are very concerned about the, the care of the animals that they're eating. So yes. we, we're, we're paying attention to that. And we're free range. And, 
So I'm going to take three. another question over okay. here. <laughs> Thank you. I come from a Muslim background and I found this fascinating, the divinity, the universality of God's religion everywhere. Muhammad once said that God sent 124,000 the world over, all to be treated equally. One of my quests is to find the messengers in all religions, mm -hmm. and I very much later on, if you can guide me where I can find these messengers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a little bit more time. Um, yes, right. Could you comment, Holly, on the Sassia series and how it relates to uh, paganism? Never heard of it. <laughs> In Russia. Uh, In Russia. Oh. Ah, on a, well, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> In Russia, there is a phenomenon, um, over 20 million books have been sold, about a, uh, a Russian woman who is more or less giving a back-to-earth nature uh, teaching for Russian people. And uh, if, if that's all right, you don't have to comment on it, you can have to talk. I, I don't know about this specifically, but there <laughs> is the Republic of Mariel, which is a very small part of the, the Russian Federation. And they are they, they maintain a, a thousands of years old pagan tradition that is institutionalized within their community. They are caught in this, this huge dilemma because they are trying to survive their their sacred forest, which is when they celebrate their, their ceremonies and have for hundreds of hundreds of years. Uh, there are petrochemical companies that are trying to raise the forest because supposedly there's oil deposits there. And then the Russian Orthodox Church wants to raise the forest because they want to wipe out the pagans. So they're kind of, and, and then the, uh, the, the Soviet bureaucracy doesn't really want to uh, give them the status of official religion because they also want to get rid of it. So there are groups like that still in, in various parts of Europe, including Russia, that are pagan, have been pagan forever, and are on the edge of well, this is definitely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I was wondering if you could comment on, I, I know you talked about the general concept of God, but if you could comment on the more specific symbolic ideas, like, I don't know, like the more again, or like how you use some of the symbolic theories from other cultures. I, I think for, for me, you know, there, there are endless uh, pantheons, right. you know, Roman and Greek and Italian right. and Norse, and so um, kind of use, yeah. for me, in particular, each each one of those deities is, a, is an archetype. And so there's a manifestation of, of similarity across pantheons. Um, you know, the Morrigan is, is the harbinger of death. Right. And um, she's also a warrior queen. And so, um, you know, if, if rather than tap into, you know, this individual that I believe exists somewhere out there, um, I tap into those qualities within myself. So if I'm, um, if, if it's become necessary for me to take a stance of um, uh, embattlement over an issue, if I'm if I'm watching somebody be killed or a woman get slapped, then the embodiment of the warrior queen would be something that I would manifest within myself to step forward. And and the same with the mother and the the the, uh, the aspect of mother and the nurturing that comes with that, which would be um, Demeter and uh, Persephone, you know, traveling into the underworld. Each one of these deities um, also has a force of nature attached to it. And so I, you know, for me, I would embody that. I, did that answer your question? You yeah. want to win. Do you use them in, like, in uh, ceremonies very often, like in, in ritual? There are times, yeah. Where you call them specific Of course, mm -hmm. of course, yes. Yes, in the back. Uh, I have two related questions. Do you see a global paganism emerging? Um, because, especially as a gentleman, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. You talked about um, uh, the connection between, I guess you all have been talking about the connection between um, paganism and specific places on the earth. But, you know, we're so globalized now, and so much of our population is urban. Do you see some kind of more generalized um, uh, worship of, of the biosphere, of the Earth itself, emerging? And, and second, I didn't hear anything about uh, sky worship. Is, is, is paganism um, uh, as opposed to, to sky god worship? 
some people do, but we tend not to use the word worship because it, it tends to externalize uh, and remove um, and makes a relationship of uh, unequals as opposed to, in a sense, equals. Um, very modest equals on our part. Um, we see, well, we see ourselves as part of that, but you know, no. Um, we revere, we engage with, uh, we pay careful attention to, we learn, we commune with, we are transformed by. Those are words that I think more accurately describe the relationship that we have with uh, divinity. The, there is a balance, we see a balance within the natural order of masculine and feminine. In fact, our, our Sabbath cycle, the cycle of holy days, which are eight holy days for us in the calendar, in fact, Four of those reflect specifically <coughs> what's happening uh, with the, the solar energies, the, the, the phases of the sun, as you will. Uh, some people uh, see the uh, solar aspect as masculine, as a kind of logos and order and uh, inseminating energy, and the earth as the feminine and the genestative and the nurturing. And that can flip. You, know, you can, you can also we can relate very much to uh, the Japanese and Madarasu, for example, who's the sun. Um, global paganism is happening. We are now a part of what they call the new religious movement in the United States, which exceeds in number both Judaism and Islam in the United States. So we're growing very rapidly. I travel a lot around the world, and um, there is a tremendous growth of, of paganism in Europe. Um, and it's grown here in Australia in the last 10 years since I've been here. I was in tears the other day when I saw these, the growth of what was happening. Um, so it's extraordinary. With regard to the broader question, the kind of generalized uh, reverence for the earth, the Gaia principle, for example, this is one of the things we talked about a lot, that there is now this sort of generalized opening cosmology of that other religions are beginning <coughs> to speak of the earth as sacred. Um, without their necessarily understanding the roots of, you know, that that has been there all along. Um, but there is, in the broader culture and in other religious movements, I think, uh, a growing awakening. I think we have time for one more. I think, I think one thing that we are saying about that is <coughs> that what, one of the things that we find is that around the world, a lot of people are embracing principles that traditionally have been pagan principles and ha are adapting them to their own religions, but there's not really an acknowledgment that these principles were kept alive by the pagan religions that came from there originally. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Andres, um, you talked a lot about the importance of us finding our own historical traditions. The question is, if I think back to my historical traditions somewhere <laughs> in Europe, that's a very different culture speaking a very different language that is almost just as foreign to me as, say, a Native American culture or something like that. So my question is, what is it about that historical connection that makes it so important? Almost like, what, what's the, the spiritual significance of that blood connection through history? I don't think it's necessarily a historical <coughs> connection as it is a cultural connection. And of course, the two are somewhat related. But I think for, you know, just as, say, the, the Lakota will tend to have a lot more in common with the Wampanoag, even though they live maybe like 3,000 miles apart, you know, than they will have with someone from Europe. I think someone who is from Hungary will have more in common with someone who's a Spaniard than with somebody who is from, you know, Africa. Uh, because, not because of race, it's not a matter of race, it's a matter of culture. So I think that patterns that still exist in our cultural uh, uh, construct are much more accessible from a European perspective because we have inherited them to some degree. So it's not so much a matter of history. You know, I'm a Spaniard. My teachers were Scottish. You know, in, in Spain, I, I am now finding remnants of paganism, like the real traditional paganism, but at the time I started, there wasn't. So I basically assimilated into a Scottish culture. Uh, but it was a lot easier for me to do that than it would be for me to assimilate into, you know, Apache culture, for instance. So I think that's, that's the main dis difference that I was talking about. Well, then, thank you all. Also, um, be sure to visit the Earth Spirit booth in the <coughs> exhibition center. We have some literature up here that you're welcome to take. And also, through the schedule of other Bureau yeah,